Alright, we're going to... We're going to continue with uh, looking at quantum mechanics. Okay, so yesterday we were looking at calculating the energy of a photon. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, the momentum of a photon, which sounds kind of odd, because if you remember, momentum is uh, E equals M times B, and you know that light has no mass. So how can photon have momentum? And this was discovered because when they were studying the interaction between light and electrons, they noticed that light would come in, so light would come in like this. So here's your photon of light. It would strike an electron. The electron would go off in a direction. And then the photon would come out with a different wavelength. Now, if you remember like collision experiments, that would make sense. You have an object that's traveling, right? And it collides with another object. The object that was moving in the first place would change speed. It's, it's giving part of its momentum to the object that was stationary, right? So how can a, how can a photon have momentum? Because it's, how do you know it's, it's changed? How do you know it changed? Now its speed didn't change because light always travels in at the same uh, speed, right? But what changed about the light? See, it's what? Not intensity, frequency or wavelength, okay? So the wavelength or frequency would have changed, which indicates something happened. Now yesterday we defined the energy of a photon as what? We defined it as uh, Planck's constant times the frequency of light. You remember this? So how does light have momentum that has no mass. Well, you remember this equation? E equals mc squared. Well, we, look, you can set them equal to each other, and you can show that light has, theoretically, mass, even though you can't really put it on a scale. Because what would happen if you set these two equal to each other? What do you get? You get hf equals mc squared. And then that will give you an ability to figure out theoretical mass of light, which would be then basically HF over C squared. So you can figure out the theoretical mass of a photon of light if you know the frequency of it, because then you have Planck's constant and then you have the, uh, the speed of light. So that, now, if you remember the equation for momentum is P equals mv. So if we expand this, then basically you get P equals m. m is hf over c squared times v. But what's the v of light? c. So that gives you hf times c over c squared. What happens then is you get this. So you get P equals HF over C. We can go one step further though. What is the speed of, uh, what's the speed of a wave? What's the speed of a wave? V equals what? F lambda, right? So now V is the same as what? C. So we could say C equals F lambda. So if you do that, you get P equals H F over F lambda. So the C is the same as F lambda. And then you get P equals H over lambda. That is the way you would calculate the momentum of a photon. So even though light has no mass, 
it has energy, and we can figure out the momentum of that photon uh, using h over lambda. So let's do an example, okay? So what would the momentum of a photon of light be if it had a frequency of 110 hertz? If it had a frequency of 110 hertz. So frequency is, sorry, not 110, 1 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now, we're looking for wavelength, right? Because the equation calls for the wavelength. So the wavelength would be uh, C over F. So we can substitute that in our equation. P equals H over C over F. That means it would be the same as P equals H F over C, which is what we had over here. So uh, Planck's constant was six times, sorry, six point six three times ten to the negative thirty-four seconds. The frequency of light is one times ten to the four hertz, and C is three times ten to the eight meters per second. Okay, what do you get? So, if a photon of light bumped into you, would you feel it? <laughs> no. Okay, what would the unit be? What's, what was the initial momentum again? It was kilogram meter per second. Uh, and the reason why it's that, because remember, what's a joule? What's a joule again? A joule is what? Kilogram meter squared per second squared. So you'll see that meter cancels out and then hertz is per second. So you're left with kilogram meter per second. Okay. Uh, so one photon of light would carry with it very small momentum, but still it's momentum, right? Because you're talking about collisions with electrons, which are really, really tiny things. Okay. Is that okay? Is that hard? No? Okay, now we can think about something else then. If, if we can say that light has momentum, even though it has no mass, maybe we can think about the opposite. Maybe we can think about matter that actually has wavelength. So you remember in the video we talked about uh, electrons can behave like waves and also like little cannonballs or pieces of matter. So we can think about then the wavelength of any particle, which is defined by this equation. Sorry, let me just give myself a little bit of room here. So what what is this equation? What do you think this is? Where did we get this from? This is from this equation. Okay? Because what's what's MV? Momentum, right? So this is the momentum equation. And we could use that then if we want to figure out what is the wavelength of matter. Now, that's kind of really odd to think of it this way. Like, if, for example, if we fire a cannonball, uh, it's very hard for me to visualize a cannonball 
as something that has a wavelength. But the math says it does. So just like light can behave like a matter, matter can behave like waves. Now, why don't you notice a cannonball? Like, because what do, what do, like what do waves do? What do waves do that matter doesn't do? Give me, give me one property that a wave does that matter wouldn't do. Yeah, so like, but give me something that you can see, that, because you can't really see that. Oh, you mean like in the water, like it goes up and down? Yeah, that's true, it oscillates. But you could say a pendulum oscillates. Pendulum goes back and forth. What, what's something that waves do that matter don't do? Right, waves will spread out. Matter doesn't do that, right? You take a cannonball, it's not going to spread out, right? It's going to be a piece of whatever it is. It's, it's going to stay confined to whatever shape it is, right? Uh, so waves will do things that matter don't do. Sorry, matter doesn't do. The reason why you don't notice a cannonball do some of the things that a wave would do is because, well, when we get to the wavelength of a cannonball, you see how tiny it is, and you wouldn't even notice it. So what would be... The wavelength of a cannonball traveling at 100 meters per second. According to this, it does. Yeah, but you wouldn't notice it because, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, so, what would the wavelength of a cannonball be? That has. So, it's, here's the mass. We got the mass. We have the speed. So, the wavelength will be Planck's constant. Okay, over m by times the speed, which is 100. So what would that wavelength be? One point three times ten to the So look at that. That's tiny. What's the wavelength of visible light? Where is it? What range? It's to the tenth of the negative seven. So you can see the wavelength here is so tiny. You wouldn't even notice it. Okay? That's why a cannonball does what a cannonball should do. It should behave like matter. But it does have a corresponding uh, wavelength. What about uh, the wavelength of an electron, which you saw in the animation can behave like a wave, can spread out, can interfere with itself. Cannonballs don't do that. Okay, they wouldn't do that. Why? So uh, let's take a look at an electron. Let's figure out the wavelength of an electron. It says it's accelerated from rest through a potential difference of 120 volts. Oh, and then we got a hint here. You guys remember your chapter 7 stuff? So what's that? That's the energy of what? Yeah, it's the energy of the electron, right? Okay, so what's the energy of this electron? How much energy does this electron have? How much energy does it have? So what's the charge of an electron? Q. Okay. Yep. What's the voltage? So what's the energy of this electron?
Okay, now, the equation is set up so that we need uh, Planck's constant, which we have, the mass of the electron, which we can Google, but we need the speed of the electron. So how will we figure out the speed? How will you figure out the speed? Yeah, because what's this electrical energy going to be converted into? It's going to be converted into accelerating the object, right? So this ends up being the kinetic energy of the electron. So what's the kinetic energy of the electron? 1.9 times 10 to the negative 17 joules. So now what we can do is we could figure out the speed of the electron. Because that's going to be equal to 1 half m v squared. So what would be the speed of this electron? So v would be 1.9 times 10 to the negative 17 times 2 over, uh, what was the electron's mass again? 9.1? times 10 to the negative 31, I think. So what's the speed of this electron? What do you get? What do you get? Six million. 495,983. So that would be 6.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is reasonable. Uh, if we got 6.5 times 10 to the 8, how would you know there's something wrong? No, close or bigger than the speed of light. So um, that should be like a warning sign to you if you get values that like this is still way smaller than the speed of light so this is fine now we have the speed so what we can do is we can go back and figure out the wavelength of this electron so that would be uh, Planck's constant H over uh, what's the equation <laughs> MV okay so H over MV so Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. The mass of the electron was 10 to the negative 31. And the speed of the electron is 10 to the uh, 6. So what would be the corresponding wavelength? Or the corresponding wavelength. One point times ten to the negative ten. So the wavelength of an electron is way bigger than the wavelength of a cannonball. So we have ten to the negative twelve versus ten to the negative. 30. What was that? Oh, 10 to the negative, sorry, 10 to the negative 10. So the cannonball's wavelength is 10 to the 26 times smaller than the uh, electron's wavelength. Now, that's important because do you guys remember diffraction? So diffraction is when a wave goes through an opening and spreads out, the, then you don't really, like if the wavelength is smaller, so if the wavelength is actually smaller than the opening, you don't really notice the, the spreading out of the wave. So if you think about that for a second, if the wavelength gets bigger, then you'll notice it spread out more. If the wavelength is really tiny, then it will just go right through the opening. So why would a cannonball behave like a cannonball? It's because its wavelength is so tiny that you don't even notice it behaving like a wave. But an electron is 10 to the negative 10 is, is quite big. 
relative to its size. How big is an electron? Yeah, very small, right? Okay, an electron is tiny. So its wavelength compared to its size, it's quite big. The wavelength of a cannonball compared to its size is very, very tiny. That's why you don't notice it. Behave like a wave. Okay. Uh, next time we'll talk about um, how you can calculate the color of light that comes out using quantum mechanics. Okay. When you know electrons get excited. All right, ladies. So let's end there. The end.